If you look at private higher education, it's a special kind of higher education where we're not an impersonal, huge uh, institution where you can basically be invisible. At Cornerstone, you matter. We see you. We take care of you. We nurture you. We love you. There are some of our students present, and they can testify to that. The Cornerstone experience is a unique experience, and we're very, very proud of the, of the students and the quality of students that we produce who complete our programs that we have in the humanities and in business. In the humanities, we have programs in psychology, which used to be our biggest department, but has now been overtaken by education, because more and more people are seeking our qualification in, uh, uh, in teaching. Uh, it's a fully accredited uh, qualification offered online. It's a PGCE, a postgraduate certificate in education, so you must first have a degree, and then you can qualify to teach with us, either in the intermediate phase or in the uh, foundation phase. And one of the lecturers in our education department, Santini, is in this room. And so that makes me very proud that uh, the Cornerstone community, the Cornerstone family, is present. Of course, we also offer programs in community development. Uh, Selina, our uh, le lecturer, will actually put together our uh, honors program in community development, which is completely unique. We're the only university in South Africa who offers an honors in community development. And we're very, very proud of that work, aren't we, Selena? Um, and then, of course, we have um, our rich heritage in theology, which I think cuts into what the conversation is going to be tonight. Um, and so it's really wonderful that, uh, that we can approach uh, topics which at Artscape, uh, Marlene LaRue says, the things that people are normally afraid to talk about, we will talk about tonight in this room. And so it makes me very, very proud that we have this relationship with Artscape and we're very grateful to them for working with us on this event. Um, we also work uh, very closely with the Center for African Studies at UCT um, and we conceptualize these events together and the project manager for the entire series at Cornerstone is Janine Carlson. So Janine, if you could just stand so people can see who you are. Um, Janine is responsible for running um, our program, which uh, is very exciting for the rest of the year. I'm just going to say it quickly in a nutshell that on the 1st of August, we have a session dealing with uh, the psycho-social uh, impact of racism. And we have an international uh, academic who's coming to join us to talk about that. And we will and we'll be joined by uh, people in the forefront of that discussions in South Africa um, at that event. And that will be held at the District 6 Museum Homecoming Center. Then on the, in September, on the 3rd of September, our Executive Dean, uh, Reverend Dr. Rudy Bates, who I apologize, is not able to join us here this evening. His wife's undergoing operation, so he put in an apology, uh, apology for not being here. He will um, have his inaugural lecture on the 3rd of September. It will be held at the center of the book, and it's a lecture focusing on hope. Um, and you're all invited, and we will extend invitations to you um, formally, um, and just make sure that you do put your name on our register so that we can keep you on our database. In September, on the 6th, we will have an issue, um, a, another critical di dialogue, sorry, focusing on the land issue. In October, we will have a, a critical dialogue focusing on education. Um, and then in November, we have uh, the, the culmination of our critical dialogues for the year with the theme, Reclaiming Agency. So keep your ear to the ground, because uh, we're very excited about the work that Jadine's doing and how she's driving this program for us uh, going forward into the rest of the year, and you can, as you can hear, it's quite a packed program. I also do want you to know that we don't only offer humanities, we offer business programs. We have certificate uh, programs in business, as well as a Bachelor of Commerce. Um, but since we are here, I want to highlight that our program 
um, in terms of, the, of working out a niche, what area in business do we want to focus on? And we're looking at arts management in particular. We um, have identified that um, our artists, many of our artists, uh, die paupers. And we really don't want that situation to continue to prevail. So we want to play a role in providing the kinds of programs that prepare people um, for the art sector and to keep the art sector and individuals in the art sector sustainable. So, of course, we're working with Artscape and with many others in putting that qualification together and making sure that it's appropriate for the, um, for the arts management sector. Um, there was uh, one point that I wanted to make, though, uh, because um, of our passion for the arts, we integrate uh, the arts into our learning processes. So tonight there will be hopefully some singing I hear and maybe some poetry um, as, the, as the program unfolds. Because we do believe that if you integrate the arts into learning, you make the learning experience all the more exciting. Um, so we can't neglect the arts in the, in the learning process. So that's all I have to say in a nutshell. Um, myself and my colleague Mbuzeli, if you'll just wave at the back there, Mzeli and I, we really wanting to get more of our students to have uh, uh, bursaries. So we have a program that we call an adopt a student program, and uh, you can invest as li as little as a hundred rand a month or thousand rand a month just by signing a debit order release form. So Mzeli's got a whole pack of those forms under his arm at the back there, and he's hoping that tonight some of you will actually be very open to donating that hundred rand a month. I don't even think you can get a coffee, a pot of coffee for a hundred rand. Maybe you can still, but you can't get a bottle of whiskey, that's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, so I really think that um, at the cost of less than a bottle of whiskey, you can actually end up saying that you support a student at Cornerstone Institute. Now, as I said, the Center for African Studies is our partner. And tonight, um, the facilitator for the event who on the program, uh, Professor Gertrude Fester, was scheduled to facilitate. And we were really looking to seeing her in action. Um, but unfortunately, uh, she's got one of those severe flu viruses, which just knocked her out completely. And she said she definitely didn't want to be here. She didn't, definitely did not want to infect the rest of you. So she's, uh, so she's asked to be excused. But uh, we've got a bonus in that we have uh, very proudly uh, recruited our own faculty manager, Dr. Crystal Janik UCT, which she completed under Professor Andre Dutoy's supervision. And her thesis was on historical land rights and communal identity. Um, and she looked at two communities, the Clarkson Moravian Mission and the Titsikama Amafengu as uh, case studies. She's held three postdocs um, at the Center for Historical Research at UWC, at the History Department of the University of Stellenbosch, and then at Plas at UWC. Um, she's also um, worked as a lecturer and done all kinds of other amazing things that will probably keep you all, all, I'll keep you here all night if I must tell you, but I just want to emphasize that she has worked in community development and she's worked as a trade unionist um, and she remains actively involved in community development where she trained adult and youth choirs at a local Moravian congregation in Val Hall. So she's still very much engaged in the arts. Um, but she will tell you that firstly, she's a mother to two beautiful children, a son, Philip, who's 18 years old, and a daughter, Emma, who's six years old. So can we give her a round of applause? And I'm handing over to her. She's hosting you for the night. Thank you, Dr. Jenica. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We have a very interesting topic this evening. And as you'll see, it's religion, spirituality, and social justice considerations towards ethical leadership. And our first um, speaker is Dr. Darlene Miller. She is a senior lecturer at um, the Witt School of Governance. 
um, and after taking up the position of National Education Coordinator at Sakao um, Trade Union, um, a food and retail trade union in the 1990s, uh, she became the director of the Institute for African Alternatives, uh, which is a research and training non-profit based um, institution in the Witwatersrand. She completed her doctorate in sociology at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, USA, and Darling initiated a series of green leadership schools, which I find really fascinating. Um, in recent years, and there she explored the indigenization of university education in South Africa, so very closely aligned to Cornerstone. Um, her recent work includes research and amateur documentaries on women's leadership, land grabs in Southern Africa, and indigenous food gardeners in Kailicha, Cape Town. So, Dr. Darlene Miller, welcome. She will be discussing uh, tonight with us what potential alternative women-centered approaches to power and governance could offer conceptions of ethical leadership. So I'm really looking forward to your contribution. And we welcome her to, um, to the front. Can you just stay with me? Because as I said, you can only run quiet. So... My talk tonight is called Send in the Clowns. And uh, uh, Crystal's going to help me sing, and uh, Reverend Bear as well. <laughs> you can do it from there if you like. Isn't it rich? You're welcome to join in. Are we a pair? Being young and lost on the ground. You are where are the clouds? Sending the clouds. <laughs> So when all else fails, it's time to turn to the fools and the clowns. So no disrespect, Reverend Bear, um, I'm including us in that category. But the Methodist Church in the Central Methodist Mission has a prayer that says, let us be foolish enough to think that we can change the world. My will first with the Hans Hans story begin. I want to begin with a clown joke first. A priest was encouraging his flock, no, to observe temperance. You spoke about whiskey early on. <laughs> and the priest said, if I had all the beer in the world, I'd take it and throw it in the river. Then he got into his stride, he said, in fact, if I had all the wine in the world, I'd take it and throw it into the river. Then finally, his coup de gras, he said, and if I had all the whiskey in the world, I'd throw it in the river. He sat down. The song leader then got up and said with a smile, for our closing song, let us sing hymn number 365, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> So friends, let's gather at the river. Yes. The main objective of my talk is to dispel some of the social justice languages of the old. To dispel some of the social justice languages of the old and raise languages of the new in a quest to pursue social justice. But in order to dispel the old language, I'm going to appeal to the very knowledge that the old language has given us. That's woman for you, a walking contradiction. So I'm going to lead in with an Italian and a German, Antonio Gramsci and Karl Marx. I use two insights from the revolutionary Antonio Gramsci. One, his insight, a famous turn of phrase, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the world. 
And the second more complicated idea, so that I can reassure you all that I didn't buy my PhD, um, is cycles of world hegemony. And I'll refer to two contemporary social theorists, Giovanni Arrighi and Beverly Silver, who expand on Gramsci's concept of hegemony. From the old graveyard, Karl Marx, I have two well-known insights. Men make the world, but not under conditions of their own choice. Yes, he was an old sexist um, and spoke about men, not never women. Um, universalized the category of men. And second, that the seeds of the new are born in the old. And that's where I'd like our talk to go. What are the seeds of the new? If they've been birthed in the old, we are so inundated with the zeitgeist of disenchantment. It's a time of disenchantment. We look around, particularly in South Africa, things don't work. People don't work for us. So where you have a context of disenchantment, where possibly could be the seeds of the new? So what are these conditions which are not of the leaders making? In other words, if we can't blame everything on the leaders. Um, we can make beautiful lists of qualities that an ethical leader should possess. But if we do not apply our miserable intellects to the structural conditions, then we are farting in the wind. We need a structural analysis of how power works in our time. And our intellects thus give us a pessimistic prognosis. Firstly, analyzing forms of power in the 21st century and beginning with the systemic or structural dimensions of power. So these two sociologists, Giovanni and Beverly, they're a marital couple, married couple. They write this incredible book called Chaos and Governance in the 21st century. And they speak about global power hierarchies, but not only the hierarchies, vertical hierarchies of power, they look at global hierarchies of power over time. And beginning with the Dutch in the 16th and 17th century, the boat builders, remember they came here on their beautiful boats that could navigate these huge oceans, imagine that. So many centuries ago, they were smart enough to build these structures, these wooden structures that could survive these huge oceans and find their way all the way here. What they explain is that in each period of history, of these cycles of history and what they call cycles of accumulation, there's one power that emerges as the hegemonic power. So at a particular phase, it was the Dutch that was your power. Then the British concentrate uh, banks and finance capital in London, and they're able to expand and colonize large parts of the world. The US then follows in the wake of the British, and after the US, well, we're not so sure. Of course, our first thing is China, China, China. But what Arigi points out is that, yes, we can see that China is an ascending power. But in actual fact, there are continuities in each cycle of world hegemony. So you see certain similar patterns in each phase. But there are important discontinuities, important differences. And what's important about the difference in this phase of hegemony and counter-hegemony is that China and the US are in quite a tango-like embrace. Their economies, their capital, their patterns of accumulation are tied together. China owns massive bonds in the American state. Both countries, it would, it's the kind of tango that if they fought with each other, they could take each other down, both countries down. Yet, despite that, Despite their codependent relationship, they are in a tough masculine tussle with uh, Donald Trump saying, my button is bigger than your button. So we're seeing evidence of severe toxic masculinity yeah. in this tottering hegemonic power. And so what Arrighi and Silver show is how the world swings. They draw on the work of Karl Polanyi to show how the world swings between these phases of stability, 
where they find some kind of rapprochement between the different powers. And then they move to a phase of clashes, fight, wars, global wars, right? So that's the first kind of structural constraint, that we had a period of the Bretton Woods, we had a lot of gentlemen's agreements which held some kind of stability, despite the troubles that the world's working classes were experiencing, that poor people were experiencing, they were able to hold some period of growth and accumulation. That is falling apart. And so when we think about our little problems here, um, because they are little in relation to the possibility of a nuclear conflagration, we need to think at that scale as well, at the global scale as well. But that's not enough. We have to think at the planetary scale too. The Smithsonian Institute, um, I think it's about 30 years ago now, they were the first to write this little essay talking through their museum to say they use this little concept of, well, it's not a little concept, Anthropocene mm. or Anthropocentrism. Anthropos, human. Centrism, centric. So they spoke about human-centric approaches to development. And for the first time, that kind of critique began to grow. The critique of approaches to development that emphasize the needs of humans. So you have academics like the World Ecology Network. Jason Moore has written a book on capitalism in the web of life. He, they have begun to say we need to examine human, the relations between humans and non-humans. You will hear people talking about sentient beings, right? Sentient beings is not just us. We are not the only things that feel, that have pain. New research is showing new things every day. So some have said, and particularly people who went to the Rio Plus 20 Summit have said that we need a complete mind shift from anthropocentrism to, some would say, planetary-centered awareness, where the planet is something that is central to our way of understanding our being. The World Ecology Network talks about human versus non-human. And one of my, as these students can be so clever, right? One of the students said, but why are they saying non-human? It's a bit like non-white, white and non-white. You're giving all other creatures a non-identity, and therefore you are still creating some kind of hierarchy between the human and the non-human. So new languages are required. And that's one of the things that Karl Marx says. He says you cannot build the future, you cannot build the new with the languages of the old. Mm -hmm. So at the same time as we take capital and Karl Marx, the prison notebooks of Antonio Gramsci, the Bible as an old text, at the same time we also mean to discard and find new languages and new ways of going forward. A third structural um, constraint or structural reality that we face is what I call, what many of us call forms of patriarchy in the 21st century. Now, what is this thing of patriarchy? Is it these women hating feminists? Uh, <laughs> some are, are being outed in the audience. Um, Patriarchy refers to masculinist leadership. Um, so it's not male leadership, mm -hmm. but there is a demographic there. It's mostly yeah. male. So yeah. yes, yeah. you are guilty. You are part of that guilt. So these systems of patriarchy extended with the phase of colonization from North America, they extended into other parts of the colonial world and replicated the systems and the values of the white male. That system of oppression and suppression was also oppressing women and Wiccans in 
Europe themselves. Yeah. The witches of Europe were in fact the spiritual healers of Europe mm -hmm. and there were many of them were women. Mm -hmm. And those knowledges that those women possessed were suppressed. Mm -hmm. And those people were turned into witches, people that you burnt at the stake. So those kinds of histories need to be reinterrogated with the, that kind of patriarchal spread of power had the same kind of effect in Africa where it suppressed not only indigenous forms of knowledge, indigenous ways of being, but it also suppressed matriarchal leadership. Mm. Women mm. were leaders yeah. in Kosa tribes, in Khoisan tribes, mm. but the knowledge that these women held was suppressed with colonization. And when all our Africanist male colleagues write about the continent, um, when um, um, Sheikh, Sheikh Anta Diop writes about the continent, he forgets to include these kinds of processes and how women and the witches of Africa and the healers of Africa and people who had different kinds of knowledge were also suppressed. So our very own Africanist scholars have created a genealogy of a masculinist account of colonization that writers, the Nigerian writer Ife Amadoum, for example, mm. is trying to retrieve mm. and say the work of one of our newest scholars, Babalwa Magodwana. She's trying to look at the body of Umakulu mm. and see what knowledge resides in the body of Umakulu. Um, so we find that there are these. I've highlighted four kinds of structural limitations to the beautiful ethical leadership that we would like to have. The global power hierarchies with your toxic, toxic masculinity at the top, playing, threatening with buttons, where there's a kind of con you know, contestation of hegemonic power. We've got these extensions of global patriarchy, which still dominates leadership today. Um, and we've also got the suppression of spiritual healers, spiritual knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and womanist knowledge, both in the, in the European context and in the African context. Okay, um, so where does that place spirituality? How do we find, given these structural limits, how do we find the language of the new? And that's where I look at the second part of Antonio Gramsci's term, his, his phrase, where he says, optimism of the world. Mm -hmm. So his pessimism of the intellect is looking at all the miserable things, right? The structural things. And that's being truthful about that. It's not saying... It's fine, we can rise above it, it's beautiful. Mm. It is not beautiful. Mm. People who speak about apocalyptic scenarios, it's very real. Mm. It's very possible that they forget themselves. Where do we as Africa and where do we as South Africans stand within that? Well, our president was um, with um, the Chinese premier and um, the president was saying that, in fact, we support Hawaii. Um, we support the, because you know, there's some kind of trade war going on and Hawaii is one of the technology companies that has been um, outlawed by the, by the, the, by the US. Um, and so that's one example of President Ramaphosa <coughs> gesturing towards China. People are talking about, if you look at international news stations, they're speaking about, a, um, about the possibility of a new Cold War. So this new language of Cold War. Um, how it will percolate towards, down towards us, we don't know. But we definitely cannot be myopic in the way that we look at these questions. Um, but what then gives us optimism of the world or optimism of the spirit? What gives us hope and re-enchants our everyday lives? 
there's a beautiful book by a sensible academic. There are not many of us, <laughs> just a few. The struggle is hard. Um, but he was a psychologist and he became more of a um, spiritual home designer. Um, and took his psychology and started writing books about the importance of spirituality and why his one book is called Caring of the Soul, beautiful writer Thomas Moore. The one I really like is called The Reenchantment of Everyday Life. The Reenchantment of Everyday Life. And what he, what he gestures at is what we in our research project have called Earth reconnection. There's also this beautiful Swedish jazz singer and she says earth calling for change, earth calling for change. So we called our project earth reconnection and in a way this is what Thomas Moore says. He says start right below, start right at the bottom and think about all the physical elements around you, think about all the materials around you and he has a chapter where he just talks about stones, where he just speaks about the symbolic significance of stones. Sylvia Vollenhoven is doing incredible work on rewriting the histories of the koi in South Africa. Um, she's written a book called The Keeper of the Kum, The Keeper of the Story. And she's produced a play called um, Kritoa. I think it was just called Kritoa. Hey? But in that play, it's so amazing because Kritoa has no form of, lit of, of written right, uh, um, self-expression. Right? She works through, she's an incredibly bright woman, she knows a lot of languages, she's got um, le uh, regal lineage, and she translates for the Dutch and everybody else. But the way she stores her memories is with stones. Mm -hmm. I thought it was so beautiful because of the symbolism of <coughs> cornerstone as well. Mm -hmm. It was so nice for me, it was the same time I discovered cornerstone too. <laughs> and um, she stacks up these stones one by one, whether something beautiful happened in her life or something really painful. Um, if you look at one small example of masculinist history making, and you think of Robben Island, where would Kratoa and her husband Peter have been? Mm. Peter was an engineer, mm. right? And um, we always go and we, you know, we're there with our nationalist patriarchal leaders and we focus on the buildings and what was happening inside the buildings. When Kratoa miscarried, as she did, because her life was so destroyed by her intelligence, she was that most terrible of things, a clever native, yeah. and most yeah. dangerous of yeah. things. Yeah. And so she was broken and destroyed by the end of her life. And part of that was birthing and miscarrying. Yeah. Where do you think that would be on Robben Island? Yeah. It would be in the soil. Yeah. Part of this journey towards spirituality is to reconnect with the soil. So like Thomas Moore, we say we want to reconnect with the plants, with the gardens, with all of the things that this high, this high level of mechanization breaks up and separates us yeah. from. Yeah. So the argument is that we are in a state of severe disconnect. Mm. We have lost our connection with our very bodies. So Many others speak of this kind of disconnect between human and non-human nature as the influence and presence of machines and industrialization in our lives. Now the development focus in South Africa and globally is integration into what? The fourth industrial revolution. Everywhere we go now, we hear the state wanting to put money into conferences, uh, policy papers on the fourth industrial revolution. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against technology. Technology is wonderfully liberating. It brings great comforts to us. But it cannot come at the expense of our connection with the earth mm. and our connection with our bodies. There are new technologies, I would argue, to guide our ways of being in the 21st century. But 
by being conservatives who hang on to the language of 20th century social justice, we are unable to embrace these new technologies. So I'm arguing that those of us who think that we are change agents and use the language of the 20th century, that in fact we are the new conservatives, yeah. the proletariat, yeah. the working class, yeah. revolution, violent revolution and change, all of those kinds of languages are holding us back with our feet in the 20th century and closing us off to the possibilities for new planet planetary-centered mm. approaches to social change. What are these kinds of new technologies for life in the 21st century? Self-governance and autonomy, with yeah. food being the most obvious mm. one, mm. right? Mm. To not hand over the governance of our bodies to the big food multinationals and the big food retailers. We've been taught to do that every day. Our urban environments shape the way we walk. It's like, you know, if you think about what happened to us as the koi, okay, um, when they, there's, a, there's also another beautiful book by Robert Ross where he looks at the archives of the koi. The koi were clever natives. They were writing in English to the queen explaining to the Queen what was going on here. And there was this constant attempt of the governor and his men to destroy the reputation of the Khoi and to present them as a lazy, um, drunken set of people, right? When in actual fact there was a high level of social engineering taking place that try to turn the koi, break them, dispossess them from their productive lands and their productive activities, force them then through requirements of cash to go onto these new farms that had been taken over by the invading groups. And at that point then, the geographies of drunkenness were laid out for them. As you came from a hard day's work in a vineyard, there would be a canteen right at the mm. end of the road mm. as you came down the hill. So those are, that's an example of how governance of your body gets taken over both politically, um, um, so that process of alienating you from the land and alienating you from your body began a long time ago. Mm -hmm. once, you use, once you lose that connection with the earth and with productive activity, and we, that practice of, uh, I mean, I don't want to sound too much like the, temp, the minister and his temperance speeches, um, but the practice of alcoholism then gets um, inculcated in your, your daily life. Um, so food is another such example where as agro-food and the monopolies of agro-food have grown, so we've lost control over our ability to say, what does this body need? It's very unique. It's a unique system. It's a beautiful spiritual creation. No one is like another one. In all this room, we all look different to each other. What does your unique body need? So that's one new technology, self-governance and autonomy. Secondly, different forms of production that are linked to self-reliance and indigenous knowledges. What is astonishing, you know, again, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin used to say, theory is gray, truth is green. What is green and that's all around us are all these autonomous food garden movements. There are now 250 gardens, urban food gardens in the Western Cape. There are a range of different kinds of gardens from your new age hippie garden to your subsistence farmer in Nyanga um, to these young men in Kaya Lichu who say, we're the cool gardeners and we are making garden cool. What are you, Polisa? I'm a gardener. And it said with pride. And they were able to overcome the water shortages in the Cape by having these indigenous 
uh, trees in their gardens. So while everybody else's gardens died, their indigenous trees held on to the soil, nourished the soil, and when the water came back, the vegetables just sprung up again, so their garden never died. Um, that's an example of what we can call endogene potential, potential for different development strategies and indigenous forms of indigenous knowledge. I don't have time and enough knowledge to talk about yoga, um, but there are incredible things that are being done across the world with yoga as a new technology. Mm -hmm. Young, um, young, young school-going kids in the projects of New York, who before would have been. Um, put into detention as a way of disciplining them, now are given yoga and meditation and they've, they've, the research now shows a significant improvement in their results. There are multiple ways in which forms of yoga like Kundalini allow you that kind of reconnection with your body, taking control of your health as well rather than farming that out to an entity that is motivated by making profit and using their machines to cut you and replace things on your body. How do you trust that knowledge over your own knowledge acquired over decades through practices like yoga? Fourthly, in our research, I'll be concluding soon, in our research we've tried to think of different kinds of leadership. Um, and the first concept that we came up with was to think of leadership as a mantle. All right, as a tip. So if you're standing here with me, a couple of you, I could possibly move to the back and you can go to the front. And this leader, le this mantle of leadership allows that kind of leading from the front, from the back, from the side, and even from within. Leadership as a crown, however, accumulates power for one powerful individual. So we've, we're experimenting with different ways of thinking about leadership. Um, that kind of leadership, the crown leadership, accumulates power in one site, in a peak organization, in a peak position like the presidency. Womanist power for all of you who are who run woman type lives, you know that you are all over the show. Maybe now we're retiring a little bit and it's getting a little better. But we disperse our power all over. We give a bit of love here, a little bit of counseling there, a little bit of something else. And so we disperse our power and are often unable to accumulate power to ourselves. Is that a balance that we want to change? Do we want to try and find something that allows us to also accumulate power so we can have some kind of intervention power for change in our environment? But to what extent does that then make us victim to the same problems of accumulated power? Yeah. Yeah. Difficult questions, but those are the kinds of new questions that, that perhaps they're not so new, but that I still think we need to be. The notion of women as selfless, I think sometimes it's a good idea to be a bad mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same in line with this notion of not dispersing and not, I don't accept fully this notion of women as earth mothers and so on. That feeds into this dispersion of our power where we are never able to. So maybe we don't want to accumulate power in one site, but maybe we want nodes of power where we can discipline and we can introduce policies and we can get our hands on resources. Um, we've, at the Green Leadership Schools, we had, we tried, we said, how does it change? There's lots of theory that shows if you change a building, you actually change the people. So um, Henri Lefebvre, the, the French author, writes about the reproduction and production of space. If you put yourself in a different physical environment, and instead of just sitting at a desk writing, you integrate gardening, yoga, art, all of those things into your academic program, and you focus on things like nature, food, land, what does that do? 
to the education that you are acquiring. So we call that green leadership. And with that green leadership, we we're trying to link what we call red leadership the social justice type revolutionary leadership with all this new focus on the environment and seeing how can you bring green and red and indigenous forms of knowledge and learning together. Um, but as we, as we threw out toxic masculinity and critiqued various kinds of patriarchal leadership, whether it was corporate leadership or left-wing patriarchal leadership, we also, of course, quickly stumbled over toxic femininity. <laughs> so, womanist leadership did not get us out of our problems either. The political challenge in conclusion for new leaders, I would say, is possibly, at this point, an act of reform. How to integrate ourselves into patriarchal systems of power and insinuate, impose, persuade that there are new forms of leadership that need to be brought into our spaces of work, both formal work and community work. If we understand the importance of reconnection and repossession as a counter to dispossession, after a legacy of dispossession and a continuation of what David Harvey, the geographer, calls accumulation by dispossession. He says, even today, we are being systematically dispossessed. Mm -hmm. Then we want to revisit our attachment to reason and secular rationalism. We say that we're part of decolonization movements, yet we only accept one form of Western enlightenment as yes. the dominant mode yeah. of knowledge, the only way of being, the only form of logic, and the only ontology that we embrace. If we open our minds to the possibility of other levels and ways of knowing, we can bring not only religion, but spirituality back into our lives as Africans, as indigenous peoples, as citizens who understand that we have indigenous potential, the yeah. potential for local development strategies that can complement new forms of industrialization and also seek to negate the negative dimensions of industrial development, such as the fourth industrial revolution. So yes, send in the pastors, the reverends, <laughs> the activists, the dreamers, the artists, the community workers, the thinkers, send in the clowns, because the clowning we have seen has left us with only tears and no laughter. Let it be the time of the fools. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darlene. I really appreciate your contribution. And um, from the sounds of it, so did everyone else. I now call on um, Reverend Berry Bear. Am I pronouncing your surname correctly? Thank you. Reverend Berry Bear is chairperson of the Cape Town Interfaith Initiative and the South African co coordinator for the Charter for Compassion. She has presented internationally and regularly coordinates multi-faith, multicultural events aimed at promo promoting an inclusive society based on understanding, compassion, and respect. Reverend Berry Bay will make a contribution around the Charter for Compassion which was signed in Cape Town in 2014, and she will look at what opportunities this document presents for conceptions of ethical leadership. So welcome, Reverend Berry Bear. Thank you so much, Crystal. Can everybody hear me? Dr. Miller, that was amazing. I feel as if I've just been on a whistle-stop tour of Igris Igrisil with all the nine worlds and everything in between from the very, very roots of the earth up into the cosmos. It's been an amazing ride. Thank you. I want to be in your class. So there is a new world coming, and we are choosing it right now, every day and in every way. Every moment we are choosing who it is that we want to be and who it is that we don't want to be. And we are choosing our children's future too. So 
What an appropriate day to be discussing ethical leadership as the United States celebrates Independence Day today with all of, with all of the issues and questions that they're facing right now. So they have a big quest going on for ethical leadership and they certainly are not the only ones in the world today who are in that position. It's one of the biggest questions in the world today. And for about 20 years now, I've had a question in my own mind. And that is when I look at our country and our leadership, I wonder, where is our spiritual leadership? Who is it that we really want to be? So it's, an, it's a question that really does invite more questions than answers at this stage. Um, Recently, I had about 26 to 28 hours of air travel, and I watched a lot of TED Talks. And during my hours of TED Talks, I realized that there are so many people in the world today grappling with the issue of ethical leadership. What does it look like? We know very well, because Einstein told us that doing the same thing over and over again is actually going to get us the same issue. It's going to get us the same result. So how are we going to make it different? Thankfully, more and more people are realizing that the new prototype of leader cannot separate their politics from their, sp from their spiritual beliefs without compromising their integrity, authenticity, and intention. These three facets of integrity, authenticity, and intention have become critical in our response to a call for deepening leadership skills at every level. So I am going to tell you, first of all, what the Charter for Compassion is. It is a document. It's just this, one page. And what it does is it takes away all those things that separate us. And unfortunately, our religious beliefs have traditionally separated us and kept us very, very distant from each other. It's been very much an us and them situation. And I'm going to tell you how we're using the charter to, to heal many of those very painful divides. So first of all, let me read you the charter and what it says. It, ca it was born in, a, in the year 2009. A lady called Karen Armstrong, who is a former nun, a former Catholic nun, she gave a TED talk, and through her TED talk, she won an enormous prize. And part of the prize was the organizers of TED Talk said to her, what is your wish? We will grant you a wish. Imagine that. Karen was amazing because she said, my wish is that we create some kind of document, a charter, everybody in the whole world can find themselves in so that we can create some kind of foundation for agreement for where, of where we are now and where we want to go on from. So it's really important that we start off with a view in mind of where we want to go. Everybody agrees that where we want to go is to a place of peace and happiness. Everyone, everybody wants that. I don't know anybody who doesn't. Stick up your hand if you're saying no to peace and happiness. I want to talk to you afterwards. But then how do we get there? And we have to have a point of commonality. And one of the points of commonality, of course, is how we look after our planet. It is this one Earth that we have to share. What do we not get about that? What do we not get about the fact that we're breathing the same air, we're walking on the same oil, uh, oil soil? How can... <laughs> I know. Sorry, this is jet lag speaking. How do we actually imagine that we're separate in the first place? But having said that, we have this myth that we really are separate, okay. However, how do we find a place of commonality from which to go from? The Charter for Compassion was therefore born in 2009. It reads like this. The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and to put another there, and to honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being, treating everybody, without exception, with absolute justice 
equity and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathically from inflicting pain. To act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism or self-interest. To impoverish, exploit or deny basic rights to anybody. And to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies, is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all people to return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred or disdain is illegitimate, to ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religious and religions and cultures, to encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity, to cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings, even those regarded as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous and dynamic force in our polarized world, rooted in a principal determination to transcend selfishness Compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential to human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable to the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. And again, if there's anybody who really passionately disagrees with any of that, I'm really keen to discuss that with you. So here we have a nucleus, a nucleus of a place to go on from. Cape Town Interfaith Initiative got involved with the Charter for Compassion very soon after its inception in 2010. And in fact, we celebrated our 10th birthday with the signing of the Charter. Um, it was signed, it was launched in Cape Town by Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, and it was a big celebration for us. Um, Cape Town Interfaith Initiative, I must just go back and give you a little bit of history about us, was born out of the Parliament of the World's Religions, which was held right here in Cape Town in 1999. And the leaders of that particular, or the organizers of that particular event, were so inspired by the wonderful conglomeration of people that gathered here in Cape Town, that they wanted to continue that momentum. So they got together in the year 2000, created the Cape Town Interfaith Initiative, and many of those founders are still on our advisory council, are still active um, in our organization today. And that for us is very exciting because it speaks to an evolution of consciousness I want to quickly describe to you what interfaith is. I love doing this because when I go to schools, I tell children this. I say to them, what's your favorite flower? And they tell me, a rose, a daisy, a lily. And I go, right. And, and which one does God love best? And they look at me. Oh, they never thought about that. And I go, and, and, and do you find a rose and a daisy in the same garden together? Yes. And what else grows there? Marigolds and grass and trees. And they come up with all these things that also grow in the garden, this beautiful garden. And you cannot tell anybody that any one is better than another one or more beautiful than another one. So which is God's favorite? Every single one of these plants is rooted in the same soil. Every one of these plants is blessed, kissed by the same courageous sun. Every one of these plants is fed by the same serene rain that falls on it. You and I breathe the same air. Which one of us does God love best? That is why I'm an interfaith, interspiritual minister. And I belong to everyone. So that is... Um, that is a foundation that I feel that we are able to give to our children an understanding of the beauty and contribution that each one makes to this beautiful garden. My predecessor, Reverend Gordon Oliver, 
who is also a former mayor of Cape Town, took that charter of compassion and he very passionately um, and with his team at the time encouraged the city of Cape Town to sign it, which was done in 2014. Um, I believe it was done, and Lucille will, remind, will confirm this, the current mayor, Dan Plato, was in office at the time. You're not sure? Okay. I, okay. Oh, you met with Auntie Pat. Okay. So it was signed into, it was signed by the city of Cape Town. And um, so Cape Town became a, a city of compassion and joined the Compassionate Cities International. There are about 400 of those cities now in the world today. And I've just come back from America where I made a point of meeting with various people around the United States who are working very hard to implement the Charter for Compassion in their cities and are finding extremely creative ways to do that. So the interfaith work and the Charter for Compassion work are integral. It's time in our society and in our in building our new world, it's time for us to let go of the of the enclaves that we build around the work that we do. It's not an empire building situation anymore. It's time for us to open up and embrace each other because all of these things, Charter for Compassion, we have the Declaration of Peace and Cessation of War that comes out of Korea. We have United Religions Initiative. We have Parliament of the World's Religions. We have so many organizations all around the world that are working for the same purpose, and that is peace on earth. And it's time for us to all join hands. I was very, very privileged while I was in the States to meet with so many of these organizations and to make plans to really amplify the voice and the work of interfaith harmony. Let me go back to how the Charter for Compassion is helping us to do this, not only at a grassroots level, but also at a global level. So people don't buy what you, what you do. This is actually quite an interesting situation. Okay. Okay, so people don't buy what you do. Um, they buy why you do it. So intention is the basis of everything. Um, just as um, Noel was saying to you earlier, Cornerstone um, is, is, about the, so is about social justice, is about equal opportunity, is about higher, uh, quality higher education. That is the intention behind all the work that, that is done, and that is what informs everything that is done here. So people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And that's a great line that was delivered during a TED talk by a leadership expert called Simon Sinek. And to me, it encapsulated the extensive drive in the world today for authenticity and inclusivity that we are seeing and experiencing. So when it comes to ethical leadership on every level, and I do believe that there is a leader inside each one of us, so allow this to speak to you personally. When it comes to this ethical leadership, what we say and what we do has to be informed at the deepest level by an intention that is aligned with the greater good. And greater good must include diversity in all its forms, for example, gender, race, age, economic and educational status, and politics. The key is respect for all. So starting from this point of commonality, which is... which. The contribu our contribution to it is the Charter for Compassion. We agree now what we are all working towards, and religion, as I've explained to you, cannot be our point of commonality because it is our beautiful diversity. I don't want us to think of it as a point of separation anymore, but more as a point of beautiful diversity. So, years of psychology research have told us that there are many common factors in the human psyche, the desire to or need to be loved, to belong, to be safe, to be free, to be at peace. And all of these fall under that greater heading of happiness. All humans want to be happy, and there are some who even employ extremely violent and antisocial methods in their quest to find happiness, but they haven't had the benefit of measuring themselves against the common human values that are expressed in our charter. So 
So separatism, anything that separates is not love and is not in alignment with the greater good. It is ultimately anti-life and almost always fear-based. Fear and, happy and happiness are not compatible and what we ultimately want is happiness. So I've made all sorts of notes here as I was listening to Dr. Miller and I'm distracting myself with these notes. So I'm going to just go back to what I wanted to say to you and go back to the story later. We want a win-win situation. Everybody has to win. You know, it's almost as if when we look at the subject for tonight, we look at religion, and then we look at spirituality, and we understand that the mystics of all of the different religions are very close to each other in their understanding, that they are all simply different paths to the same experience, to the same spiritual enlightenment experience. And every single one of these paths is just as valid as the other. The call is to love. So we look at respect. And we learn that respect is a very, very big deal in how we treat each other. So we look at the workplace, for instance. And we learn that how respect is used in the workplace, or the lack of it, will ultimately inform the outcomes. So a workplace in which you are subjected to sarcasm, to belittlement every day, it's been proven in studies that those people are much more likely to make mistakes, are much more likely to be less productive, less clear-headed, and are going to be fuzzy in their decision-making. They're going to be insecure and unsure of themselves. That's going to affect the bottom line of any company. So it makes a lot of sense that, that it's going to, it makes a lot of sense from a productivity point of view and from a bottom line point of view to implement something like a charter for compassion in various companies that is going to inform and make your workplace not only a happier place but also a more productive place. Everybody gets happier. There are many leaders in the world today who are living examples of what can be achieved when we bring our spiritual lives into alignment with our business lives, into alignment with our political lives, into alignment with everything that we are and we say and we do. And there are also too many examples right now of leaders whose authenticity has been, or lack of authenticity has been outed because of social media. Social media voyeurism is so rife in the world today that being who you are being a different person in this place and in that place, it just doesn't work anymore. You can't wear your mask all the time anymore because you are going to be outed. You have to walk your talk. You have to be who you are. The question here, though, is are we teaching our new leaders how to do that? Because what we seem to be doing to many, in many instances is putting them into a place where they are being mentored and taught by people who still represent the old paradigm. So what are we doing for our young leaders that is different? And our young leaders do have a voice. I think one of the most important discussions, conversations in the world today also is that intergenerational discussion. I'm very fortunate that in my board of five people, three of them are in their 20s. And these are people that I am guided by. I listen to them every day. And I ask them about the new languaging I ask them about their perspective because if I am not working for them and for the world that they will inherit and their children will inherit, then what am I doing this for? We also look at leaders in the world today who, um, who do embody that bridge between an old paradigm and a new paradigm and we have them all over the place. We look at Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, isn't she amazing? Didn't she do some amazing work when, when that terrible tragedy happened in New Zealand? The Muslims were gunned down in their mosques in Christchurch, 50 lives lost. And Jacinda Ardern stepped into that role of the compassionate leader with such decisive integrity and authenticity that the world was brought to its knees in awe. I look also at His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan, and he's been doing amazing work in the world today. 
um, actually for many, many years, I had the great privilege of meeting him in April when um, one of my colleagues, James Ellman from Faith, Hope, Love Communities in Elsie's River, James and I had collaborated on a very, very humble event in Elsie's River, um, prayers for the city, love of our neighbor, and we won World, you know, United Nations World Interfaith Harmony Week. We spent Holy Week in the Holy Land, and we got to meet the King of Jordan. And when I took that exquisite gold medal from the King as he handed it to me, he said, Barry, I hope that you will keep speaking the message of interfaith harmony in the world today. I hope that you will keep doing the work that you're doing, and I really want to encourage you to keep talking about it. It's such an important thing in the world today if we're ever going to have peace. And I carry that very, very deeply in my heart. I took that message very seriously. And it was one of the reasons that I stayed for a month in the United States, meeting with people like Parliament of the World's Religions, like Charter for Compassion, and various other interfaith communities around the states, um, simply to work out how we can work together to amplify that message that is going to take us and inform our ethical leadership going into the future. I also think that one of the most important things that we need to understand as we look to what this new prototype of human looks like, I really valued what you said, Dr. Miller, about the, about, um, the toxic masculinity and toxic femininity that very often seems to, seems to get in everywhere. It seems, to, it seems to be a large part of what we're dealing with in the world today. Because I think that the return of the divine feminine and the return of the divine masculine are inseparable. So a good leader today actually holds both of those attributes and is able to take from both of those parts and absolutely use them in the world today. So our new leaders very often are coming from the LGBTQI plus community. They are very often under 40. Thank you. <laughs> and they are amazing. I was, I was so privileged in my seminary class to, have, to, to graduate alongside a trans man and a trans woman. And I understand the value of these beautiful, beautiful souls who hold the truth of all of this knowledge in their bodies, and they are the prototype, new human, new leader. We need to listen to them. So remember that we are looking for unity and not separation. We need to remember this when we cast our votes. We need to look for truth. We need to look for leaders. And if we can't find those leaders, we need to be those leaders. So how have we used the Charter for Compassion in Cape Town? I want to tell you that we have used it in a beautiful healing paradigm. I mentioned to you that the, about Jacinda Ardern and her beautiful behavior after the um, terrible massacre in the mosques in Christchurch. So we held an observation, um, observance of compassion, and it was held in Grotekerk. And the Muslim community of District 6 joined us for that, because it was for them, for their people. And we asked four leaders of four different um, faith communities to each read one paragraph from the Charter for Compassion. And yes, they were all men. They were all patriarchs in their own way. And they represented that group most resistant to change. It was one of the most profound experiences of my life. Because what we experienced was in coming together to send healing and compassion to Christchurch, we experienced a depth of healing for ourselves that we just didn't see coming. It ended up almost as a celebration of love and healing. And what better way to shift a paradigm than to celebrate? We need to remember that celebration is one of our greatest tools. 
So then, so, thank you. So then, just a month later, Sri Lanka happened. And the sheikh from District 6, who had been in Krutakirk with his community, came to us and said, the Christians have been killed in Sri Lanka. I want to reciprocate, and I want to host an observance of compassion in my mosque. And he did. And again, we brought out the Charter for Compassion, and each of the leaders there read it. The minister from Krutakirk came and delivered the most beautiful heart-centered speech, and again, an enormous sense of healing was experienced, not only sent to the people of Sri Lanka, but experienced for ourselves. That is the power of what happens when people get together with common purpose. So, I want to conclude by telling you that diversity is our superpower. Let us celebrate it. I think of all of us as the most beautiful creative garden with all the different flowers blossoming abundantly under the courageous and unprejudiced sun. We are currently, as Cape Town Interfaith Initiative and Charter for Compassion, we are currently in talks with Mayor Dan Plato to see how we can explore ways to further benefit our city using the Charter for Compassion so that we truly become an, a, a, a compassionate city. We have so many ideas, ideas. I've come back with a full basket. I'm really looking forward to exploring all of those. And I think that the future is very bright if we can all just continue to hold that picture. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Bay. What's common? What's the common language? The common language between the two speakers, Dr. Darlene Miller and Reverend um, um, Bay, um, is inspiring. Um, both have spoken about hope. Both have spoken about a language that um, emphasizes reconnection, nature, um, soil, um, self-governance, self-authority, self-reliance, integration, reconnection, putting on the mantle of inclusion, servant leadership, for me, that speaks to the element of dispersed power that Dr. Miller has um, so eloquently spoken about, where she captured the term that we can identify with of earth mothers. She's spoken of nodes of power that we can identify with as being transformational leadership. Um, and she's asked us, both speakers have asked us to re-look at the language that we use um, for social justice, the language that we use to engage each other with. Um, using these terms, but as Dr. Miller has said, a language following on um, from Karl Marx um, that draws from the seeds of the past, the new emerges from the seeds, fr out of the seeds of the past. So um, let's hear what um, you, what you, how you've um, engaged yourself as listeners and participants with um, these two dynamic speakers, whom I thank for their contribution. Ah, I hand over to you. Any questions? Contributions? You've been an active listening audience. Yes. <laughs> Can you please identify yourself, name yourself, and then um, so that before you um, make your contribution, please. Indeed, I am that which they speak of. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lebum Ngai. Um, I am a traditional healer above everything else, because uh, recently I finally completed my training, uh, a 15-year journey. So it was quite 
I think for me, firstly, I just want to uh, commend both speakers. I, oh my goodness. These women, I think both of you in your spaces of influence are phenomenal because uh, from Dr. Miller, we got an, an underpinning that we, 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 we tend to overlook sometimes, you know, when we, we talk religion because we're always thinking, okay, religion is about, you know, uh, exclude, exclusion and excluding people, you know. Um, so we needed to go back and understand what is, what, what is the power in, in religion, what are the power dynamics? What are the um, what are those things in, in, in the, you know the structural elements about power, about religion, about leadership, even you know? Um, and I really, 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 uh, Dr. Miller appreciated the the mantle uh, leadership that you are talking about because it, it's exactly what we are about um, as spiritual healers and traditional healers as well. Um, being in the LGBTI space, thank you, uh, Rev. Be oh my goodness, you, you, you are leadership. <laughs> um, I wanted to, 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 to commend the, the, the space and to commend you as well, and of course, the, the charter that you are talking about, because it's so needed in our society right now, um, because it almost, from those seeds of the old, you know, the new language that we are looking for. What this charter does is to say it's a new time for religion. It's a new time for how we interpret spirituality. And in this time, or in this epoch, unlike the epochs and times of the past, let's look at what brings us together. And religion should now be what brings us together instead of what separates us. So I, I you, mind blown, thank you. Thank you. Any further contributions? Yes? Thank you very much. My name is Mtande and I'm from Cornerstone. Uh, I'm humbled by the, by the wonderful speakers that have spoken to us this afternoon. But while I'm sitting down, I'm just comparing these two things, religion and spirituality. At the same time, I'm thinking about what they've said in relation to the, the ethical leadership. Mm. I'm just thinking in my mind, when I, before I go to sleep every day, I, look, I read a piece of newspaper or I watch the news of the, the TV. Where is ethical leadership in our country? What is, if, if you see what is happening with right now, the current news, the SAPC is running short of money, the Daniel is in trouble, the ESCOM is in trouble, the, S, the, SAS, the SAA is in trouble. Now, when you talk about ethical leadership, to me, the definition of ethics comes into my mind. So I, I like us to think deeply what we mean or how religion and, and spirituality can really influence uh, ethical leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Our speakers are noting the questions. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline. I'm from the Holistic Wellness Compassion Center in Port Owen. I'm really, really, really inspired by everything that was said here tonight. Um, it gives me hope. It absolutely gives me hope. Um, having been a community volunteer for more than 40 years in Cape Town and South Africa, it's lacquer to hear that um, there's a change afoot. Um, and one, one feels it. One absolutely feels the change. So yeah, the ethics and the issues are there. But I think if more people actually see the positive potential that we have as a nation, 
then perhaps it will actually change the atmosphere and change the way people engage with things. So um, I want to touch on two things that were said that really caught my attention. The one is, yes, absolutely, um, the LGBTI and the, the new. What they actually offer us is truly a gift in terms of social justice um, and an ethical leadership, if one just understands neuropsychology and the way um, the brain works. Ultimately, it does impact on having journeyed the way that people in the LGBTI sector do journey. It's different. Myself as a bisexual woman, absolutely, my brain don't work like a heteronormative person's brain works. It just doesn't. I see things differently. I engage with the world differently. This is true. So thank you very much for that. It really touched the depths of me, inspired me. Dr. Darlene, what can I say? Ethical leadership, absolutely. Understanding the spirituality of Africa, who light bulbs. Things I haven't even thought of, I haven't even thought of, it opened up for me. So higher education with a difference. Thank you very much, Cornerstone. You've given me food for thought to learn to change the world. Thank you very much mm. from me. Thank you. Yes? Well, not so much a question, if that's okay. And not so much a question, mm. more of a, a little bit of a feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very, my name is Odette, I'm a death doula. And a death doula is something that is very old, but is coming very new. So it is something that happened eons ago and is now taking place once again. So it's, it's learning from what we did long ago and making it new now. I'm very, very, very privileged to be a personal friend of Barry. And the difference she has made in my life is phenomenal. So in terms of ethical leadership, just for the people in the room, remember to be the change you want to see. And that ethical leadership starts with you. So it doesn't start outside of you. It starts inside yourself firstly, and then in the communities that you affect and the people around you. It's like when you throw a stone into a pond, those ripple effects are felt outwards. So be the change you want to see. And then the beautiful things that the doctor talked about will happen all by themselves because people will respond to that rippling. Um, so yeah, with the greatest amount of gratitude. Thank you very much, it was fabulous. Thank you. Another speaker. Good evening all. Um, I'm Pamela Harris, a public servant for almost 31 years in the provincial government of Western Cape. And indeed, it was very a learning journey um, with a focus on, I don't think it's very unknown, the ethical conduct. Um, I think both speakers has just brought us back to where we need to start, and that is with the self. Mm. And I think we have seen in our own little beings and existence of how the world has changed ourselves and you as well. And it starts with the self. Maslow's hierarchy of needs informs us about the level or the lower order needs for us to have in order for us to actualize. But actualization doesn't mean that you've arrived because none of us arrives on its own. We stand on the beings of others before us and those many, many years before us. So we cannot be disconnecting ourselves. This is what I think the mechanization of society is trying to do to us, is to dislodge us from reality. And if you allow it, it you're going to look like the um, hunchback of Notre Dame. Ha, ha. Um, 
This is the pessimism that Antonio speaks about. That is how you're going to look. But if you appreciate what's out there in terms of nature, you will find compassion. Um, it's a part of our existence as humans is to be compassionate. We can quote biblical scripture of the commandment says that love thy neighbor like you love yourself. Now, I think Dr. Malay touched on that point of self-autonomy. So where does it start? So I think it's a matter of if we're wanting to bring in the generational intermixes, it's about integrating yourself with whatever is around you and not thinking that you're super beings. We're not. And I think compassion comes with humility. So we need to be humble. And I think birds also teach us that when we look at them, they can fly so high but they come back to the ground to pick up whatever they need. Need, not want. Because want is, so, is associated closely with greed. And because of greed, some of these ethical cultures have somehow dissipated, right? And we've gotten ourselves into this dilemma of malema, or almost like the nail and whatever else we're finding ourselves in. And that is just the reality. But it starts, and I want to conclude, with the self. So I think Cornerstone Institute is assisting us to pull us back to ourselves and see what is the contribution out of myself I can make towards society to be an enabler of that harmonious and peaceful end goal, I think. That is what we all would want. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask our speakers now to make the um, contribution to some of the questions and um, additional insights that our participants gave. You've spoken so beautifully from the floor, not much to add. Um, but I do want to say to the cornerstone um, Person, I didn't catch your full name. Mm -hmm. Mtandeni. Mtandeni. Yes. Okay, Mtandeni. Um, there's a tendency in South African politics to be obsessed with a different kind of male gaze. So in feminist um, theory, we spoke about the male gaze, but we were talking about male desire over the female body. But this is a kind of power male gaze, where there's an obsession, obsession with the national polity, with the positions of power that have accumulated, with the presidency, with the political parties. And if you listen to our left-wing comrades, they can go on ad nauseum for decades about the failings of the ANC or the failings of the DA. And we're trying to say, come shift your gaze. That is a patriarchal gaze. Shift your gaze down. Hear what Jackie says. Look at the spirituality of Africa. See what our own indigenous potential is. See the leadership that we all embody, as they've said, within us. And then we can have some re-enchantment and hope in our lives. And it doesn't mean that we, that we, that we uh, can ignore those sites of power. We're not liberated from the task of building sites of counter-power, but how we conceive of counter-power has to be different and less obsessed with the status and peak points of power. Okay. Thank you. Reverend, Reverend B. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everybody who contributed um, comments and questions. I just want to speak a little bit into that also, because what has been said is quite right. Obviously, leadership starts with us. And I did make the point that if you can't see the leadership, then you need to be the leadership. And you need to be the leader that you want to see. And each one of us is a leader in our own lives. So we have, um, the Charter for Compassion has a thing called Ch Compassionate Integrity Training. Isn't it sad that we actually need that? 
but what it does is it informs a new kind of leadership. Um, so I think that one of the things we really need to do is start to train young people to be the leaders that they want to be, rather than to be under the apprenticeship of leaders that they don't want to be. Um, and Dr. Miller made the very made the excellent point about children who are being taught meditation um, in schools, meditation and yoga in schools. That is one of the things we need to do. Our school system needs to actually change. Um, we, have a, we have a program in Cape Town Interfaith Initiative, which is uh, our schools program. It's the Marlene Silbert Youth Interfaith Intercultural Program. We work with teenagers. We take teenagers from... Um, who are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and Hindu. And some of them, because of the geographical fragmentation of Cape Town, would, may never ever, a, a, a Muslim child may never ever have met a Jewish child before. So we're growing up in a very fragmented way, and this is, this is part of the separation. But we put these children together, and instead of re thinking that, oh, that person's the enemy, Literally, by the end of their first five-day camp, they're sitting on each other's laps and they are best friends for life. And then they spend the next two years doing projects together, um, social, so, social um, justice projects or social awareness projects that get them really working with common purpose. But the other thing that the founder of this particular program, Marlene Silbert, has done is she's put the Charter of Compassion into language that is accessible to young children at schools. And she's working very hard with the Western Cape Department of Education to have that children's charter accepted in all of our schools. So a lot of things are happening. I want to tell you that I'm encouraged by the fact that we know there's a lot of work to be done. And you know what? There are lots of people like me and my team and Dr. Miller and Cornerstone Institute, lots of people who are willing to stand up and do the work that needs to be done. So I have, that's why I have so much work for the, um, hope for the future and so much trust in the future. And I am going to continue to trust fearlessly and to trust fiercely that we can do this. Together we can do this. Thank you. I'd like to bring our evening discussion to a point of closure. Um, by combining as, and using my position as facilitator to combine um, all of your contributions and especially the contributions of our two very dynamic um, speakers by saying that you've presented us with a common language. On the one hand, we've heard um, the term new paradigm. On the other hand, we've heard the term new language, a new language is needed. Um, a new language, a new paradigm that incorporates the greater good, that talks about the greater, the greater good, that talks about happiness, that talks about harmony, that talks about respect for all, and most importantly, love, inclusive love, under, under a mantle of leadership. Okay. So, um, not crown leadership, a mantle leadership. And for me, what is really um, significant is the, um, is the discussion of both that centered around hope. That centered around hope. So, um, thank you. Thank you that through hope, we can move towards breaking the alienation and gain control of ourselves, our bodies more especially, as women and men in this world. Um, and I want to end off with something that really touched me, and that was the cornerstones, Kratoa stones. Thank you. <laughs> okay, without holding you here much longer, um, what a stunning evening. Um, and I must say that I'm quite stunned coming from the word stunning. And I think maybe that is what we're all feeling. It's a feeling of reflection. <laughs> like what a stun. Um, a feeling of reflection, a feeling of deep thinking, um, and, a, and a call for action. 
that's what I, I, I got out of this evening. And I wanted to know that this was a wonderful audience, a wonderfully uh, intimate space that we could have this conversation in. But we are amplifying the conversation, in that you would have noted that the conversation was recorded, uh, video recorded, and it goes on to the various platforms that we have. At Cornerstone, we'll make those links available to you so that you can always go back to listening to the talks again and reflecting further on what was being said. I also want you to know, which I should have probably said at the beginning, was that it was also audio recorded. And it's um, audio recorded by courtesy of Bush Radio, which means that the, the, it, the, the, this evening's talks by the speakers will be edited and then, um, with your permission, we will share it with you and um, broadcast it on Bush Radio. So, it means that more people, other than who's sitting in the room, will hear what it is that was said tonight. And I think that's very, very important, given that we want to move from an intimate space like this into a, a broader, a, a reaching a broader audience. So, to the speakers, uh, Darlene and um, Reverend Berry, uh, we, we, uh, we just can't thank you enough for what it is that you shared with us tonight. Um, to the team, Janine, uh, managing the content, I think you're doing a brilliant job. Thank you so much to Logistics, Zenat, and the team who takes care of the uh, logistics, especially the media team. Mazzelli and adopted student, don't forget, he's waiting there with the debit order form. Um, um, Artscape and the Centre for uh, um, African Studies at UCT um, in Gertrude's absence, we really appreciate. Um, I want you also to know, in terms of amplification, the, the, the input that you've written, we'd like to collect that from you. And then uh, we've met with the editor of the Argus this evening, and he's agreed that we could publish those as op-ed opinion pieces in the Argus as well. So we're going to be doing that too. And I also want you to know that the Cape Towner is here and will um, write an article on what it is that you experienced here tonight. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And finally, before I go, um, I just want to ask if we can um, <clears throat> observe a moment of silence. Uh, a very dear associate and friend of mine um, and of Cornerstone, uh, Dr. Lionel Scott Muller. Some of you might know him. He's the director of the Ashley Creel Foundation. He passed today. Um, he passed in the context of his work. He was addressing his board meeting which I hope not going to happen to be my board meeting next week. He got a heart attack at this board meeting, and he died. <laughs> I know, but I, I mean, you know, it made me think today, especially in the context of what we're talking about, how short and precious life is, and how we share these uh, moments with each other, and how this makes the, the night even more special for me. So if you could just observe a moment of silence for Dr. Lionel Scott Muller. And then um, finally, Natasha Box is here. She's a, a woman who's active in winemaking. And I've asked her to come, especially so that next time when you come to our next event, we'll have a glass of wine available for you to hang out and continue talking um, um, as the evening unfolds. So, Nat uh, Natasha, I'm preempting our conversation about you sharing uh, your wines that you have in your selection uh, with us. <laughs> And then, uh, in terms of action, um, you know, the Charter for Compassion is certainly something that um, we, I'm inviting you to bring to Cornerstone. And that certainly we, as a the Cornerstone community, would be interested in signing that Charter um, as well. From my perspective, I really think to talk to what we have. And then I want you all to know that um, with Dr. Darlene Miller, we're also working on a, a, an urban agriculture project. And we ask for your prayers that this project, in fact, does come our way and that we are, in fact, going to be able to play a, a role in this wonderful uh, extended metaphor that um, we celebrated this evening of the garden and, and how that explanation helped us to understand how we, we live together. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And we hope we see you at future Cornerstone events. Good night. <laughs>